Thanks for listening to this Institute of Art and Ideas podcast, bringing you philosophy for our times. Here at the IAI, we're committed to taking philosophy out of dusty books and lecture halls and into the heart of public life. If you enjoy this debate and want to carry on the discussion, or watch over a thousand more debates and talks on all the latest issues in philosophy, science, politics and arts, visit iai.tv. Remember to subscribe and review on iTunes. Our theme this evening is the limits of language. The power of words is a wonder, and language perhaps our greatest skill. Yet the gap between the sound of a bell and its description is huge. What follows? Our speakers tonight are, to my left, Paul Bogosian, who's Silver Professor of Philosophy at New York University, which, under his supervision, has become one of the top philosophy programs in the world. Paul's publications include Fear of Knowledge. To his left is Ray Monk, who's Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southampton and the author of several award-winning biographies, including Ludwig Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius, which won the John Lewin Rees Prize and the Duff Cooper Prize. And to my right, Joanna Cavenna. She's a novelist, and she was named one of Granter's best young novelists in 2013, and she's written for the London Review of Books, The Observer, and, I'm bound to say, for Prospect. And her second novel, Inglorious, won the Orange Award for New Writing. Um, each speaker, I'm sure you're familiar with the format by now, each speaker is going to speak for three minutes, um, and then we are going to dive into what I hope will be a fascinating debate and then leave time at the end for you to ask questions. So I'd like to ask Ray Monk to kick, kick us off on the theme of the limits of language. Well, speaking as uh, Wittgenstein's biographer, uh, Wittgenstein in his first book, Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, as he says in the preface to the book, set out to... Uh, delineate the limits of thought, and then he added, as you know, as an afterthought, as it were, he said, or rather, not of thought. He says because to, in order to to set out the limits of thought, you'd have to think both sides of it, which would immediately involve you in a contradiction. So he says, no, his task is not to his, his task is is to describe the limits of the expressions of thought, i.e., uh, the limits of language, and this is what he sets out to do in his first book, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. And famously, he says, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. The book begins with the statement that the world is the, is the totality of facts, not of things. And the theory of meaning expressed in this book uh, says this, that to every fact there is, a corris- uh, there is a corresponding proposition which states that fact. So all the facts of the world, then, are statable by propositions. But that isn't the end of the matter, because uh, towards the end of the book, he says there is the inexpressible. That's to say, when you reach the limits of your language, you haven't reached, as it were, the limits of everything, because, he says, there is such a thing as looking at the world as a whole. And so all these things that he says uh, cannot be expressed, and they include ethics, aesthetics, religion, the meaning of life, philosophy, and logic he says, all those things cannot be stated in propositions, so when you reach those things, you've reached the limits of language, but they can, he says, the things of of, of ethics and religion, the meaning of life, these things can't be stated, they can't be said, but they can be shown. So in drawing a distinction between what can be said and what has to be shown, Wittgenstein was saying, well, here are the limits of language, but we can, in some sense or other, transcend those limits. Good. Well, um, that was a very interesting setup. Of course, Wittgenstein had a very restricted view of propositional meaning, which is one of the reasons that he ended up saying that uh, ethical statements don't really express propositions. I think we tend to think that uh, that that view is too restrictive, Um, that there is, when you say it is wrong to uh, abuse an innocent child for fun, that's that's not just some kind of exclamation. This is really making a statement, and a very important one. So um, um, if we ask more generally, it seems to me we do need to recognize a distinction between, on the one hand, conceptual representation, quite generally thought of thought itself, which involves concepts, and language, 
and over and above that, the world which language seeks to describe, including perhaps uh, even describing normative facts about the world. Um, and so when I, when I try to think about the, this issue of the limits of language, I think one question that we should be asking is, is language understood as this public thing of which English is one instance, though of course there are many other languages, um, is it limited relative to thought? That is, are there things that we think that we can't express in language? A different question has to do with the limitations of thought itself. Um, and you might think there isn't necessarily a contradiction in the idea that thought is limited uh, because uh, it, not every instance in which you might identify a limitation like that is one where you're thinking a contradiction or thinking both sides of the, of the boundary. You might think that there are, for instance, forms of experience um, that have a definite content, but which you cannot somehow capture in conceptual or propositional terms. That would be a case where you are familiar, as it were, with one kind of meaning, familiar with another kind of meaning, and see some kind of difficulty in expressing the one in terms of the other. Um, and I, 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 we, we, as the, as the uh, debate progresses, I think we'll probably be able to look at instances of that. Um, I think a lot of these uh, uh, claims of limitation have to be handled very carefully because there is a tendency to make a very, very quick move from the sort of thing that I think uh, Jonathan expressed when he read the initial setup, which is to say there's a very big difference between the sound of a bell and the description of the sound of that bell. And that sort of strikes one as a very important fact because you think, look, I might not be able to recover um, the sound of the bell from the description of the sound of the bell. But I think that's a bit too quick. In general, there is a distinction between the representation of something X and X itself. There's a distinction between the description of a car and the car. That is, those are very different things. So if we want, we can't just go from the fact that I have spoken too long to any interesting conclusions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, obviously, there's an intrinsic paradox to the debate. We're trying to posit the limits of language within language. So intrinsically, we will be limited if the debate is correct, and otherwise we've disproved the notion. Um, I think also, I mean, limits attend to any mortal experience. We are all limited. Our perspective on the universe is not omniscient. So vantage point within language we relay a limited perspective in what one assumes is a human system and thereby limited. So, um, and yes, we'll discuss, I'm sure, many further nuances of what is potentially limited, very intense physical experience. We don't necessarily relay to ourselves in beautiful, cogent sentences. Um, our pre-linguistic experience of infancy, I think there's a lot that we can discuss as we go along. Um, I'd say also there are imposed limits on language, deliberate attempts to circumscribe consciousness through a control of what language can be used, and that happens within coercive totalitarian regimes, um, something like the three years natural disaster to express the deaths of tens of millions of Chinese people under Mao's policies. So something like that is trying to condition what can be thought through language, that's a decisive attempt to impose a limit. Um, I'd also say there are euphemisms, of course, war on terror, we live within them, austerity. Um, so this awareness of limits, I think, is incredibly important for an individual trying to navigate what is beyond um, her or him. Um, I'd also say, though, I mean, I'm a stray novelist, and I wanted to make a case for this extraordinarily odd, fascinating, moving at times transcendental experience within language of poetry, of words that have moved people to inordinate new states of consciousness and being. And I think that's an exceptionally fascinating region of language. Um, to give a couple of succinct examples, say that great O to the West Wind, Shelley, um, make me thy liar even as the forest is. So we have Shelley's beautiful ecstatic response to nature. He hears the forest being converted into a lyre by the wind. He feels himself, he wants to sing. There's this double layer of metaphor. He somehow expresses something that is almost ineffable through language. Um, 
So I'd say who has not been transformed and inspired and imbued with almost new states of consciousness. And as we grow, as we read, our consciousness changes and we, we somehow apprehend the subjective, otherwise limited states of others through these words. So I think that's a, a kind of strange and esoteric aspect that we all experience of language. Um, I'm going to end with good old Virginia Woolf, who's so eloquent despite the limits of language. And she says, words are full of echoes, memories of associations. They have been out and about in people's houses, in the streets, in the fields for many centuries. They are the wildest, the freest, most irresponsible, most unteachable of all things. You can catch them and place them in alphabetical order in dictionaries, but words do not live in dictionaries. They live in the mind. Thanks. The debate. Theme one. Thank you very much, Joanna. And... Um, it's particularly useful, I thought, that Joanna reminded us that there's a political dimension to the question of the limits of language. It's not just a question of um, epistemology or metaphysics. Joanna, I wonder whether I can start with you. You started by talking about um, the extent to which uh, the human's perspective is, is limited. But at the end, you were seeming to suggest that there are certain uses of language, particularly poetic language, which the implications seem to be put us in touch with aspects of reality that aren't caught in the net, in, nor in, the, or, in the ordinary run of uh, linguistic activity. Have I, have I got that right? Or am I to yeah, you it's, this, it's that yeah. weird paradox of our lives, isn't it? That one is alone and yet one isn't. It's that completely bizarre aspect of human experience, which inevitably is relayed through some of our most emphatic expressions in language, mm. poetry and, and myth and fable. And so I'd say... It's, we are all conditioned by the fact we don't know what's going on. The universe is in large, vast reaches of the universe are unknowable. We're never going to arrive at a definitive answer. And so in that respect, our language must intrinsically be limited. We cannot mm. think all thoughts eternally and forever. Mm. But yet, as you say, there are these odd... The word ineffable is, of course, often used to try to define these experiences... There's something, some within symbolism, of course, the gaps in symbolism, the deliberate gaps. Ezra Pound, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough. So he's just trying to suggest that that's how it strikes him at that moment. It's not the definitive, all-encompassing experience. But, and as soon as you read that, you, your own experience changes of, of mass crowds in London, and it's a beautifying experience. They, you know, people look difference there's this mm. natural metaphor that he's mm. invoked paul joanna's suggesting that um so she's in, quite insistent on the provisional nature <laughs> of um, hum, linguistic expression um and saying that one of the things that literary language does is intensify that sense of uh provisionality in the end you in your opening remarks made two distinctions um distinction between concept and language, and then the distinction between our conceptual repertoire, whatever form that takes, and the world. I think what Joanna was talking about there was the, sometimes our inability to get hold of the world or the nature of reality linguistically. Is that, um, which, which of those distinctions, um, or which of those senses of there being limits to language is one that interests you most or which you think is the most significant? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, the, the, John raised so many interesting issues. Um, uh, I guess it's partly a, a matter of zeroing in on uh, what it is that's at stake and what it is that we, we're claiming. So, for instance, when people talk about the limits of language, um, it's, it's odd to illustrate that by, by pointing to, say, euphemisms. Now, it's euphemisms. I live in the United States, and people love euphemisms. Right there, you know? mm, extreme it's, uh, rendition. <laughs> it's an incredible euphemism-ridden uh, society, and it's interesting to ask, what function is that playing? What is the sort of hiding thing? So, for instance, you know, uh, if you're in a restaurant, the, the waiter or waitress will come, and they'll never say, have you stopped eating that? They'll say, are you, are you still working on that? You know? So this is some, this, there is some kind of deflection going on. Of, uh, but, but that's not an example of a limit to language. That's an example of a use of language to achieve a certain function. So the question is, could I have stated more accurately what it is that I'm doing? I'm not working on that thing. I'm eating it. Um, and, 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 and one can go further. So I think um, there are... There are, there's a question of limits, but there's also a question of the different functions within language and the different uses to which they're put. Uh, the, the thing that interests me is, um, is the question whether there is a kind of meaning that we experience, um, which for some or other reason cannot be captured in what 
conceptual terms. And concept, what I mean by a concept, so this bears on that first distinction. Yeah. Um, uh, there is the word red, and then there is the concept red. And these are to be distinguished. How do we know that? Well, we know that because there are monolingual French people who don't have the word red, but they have the concept red. So the concept red is what, as it were, all uh, e e equivalences for the word red in other languages express. And when we see something as red, and in fact, in, you know, infants can see things as falling under certain concepts without having the natural language words for them. So the, it's, a, it's a very important distinction to observe. Mm. Ray, can I bring you in here? Yeah. Um, I wonder if you wanted to develop that, this, this notion of the relationship between concepts and words and what follows from that as far as this question of the limits of language. Well, not so much concepts, mm. but... Um, Cognitive experiences, as it were. I mean, I mean uh, in his, so, so I, in, in my opening talk, I talked about uh, Wittgenstein's early work. Mm. In his later work, he, he gave up the, the, that theory of meaning and the, the view of logical form that underpinned it. Um, and he was much inclined in his later work to emphasize the things that we can't put into words. And so he, he would say, look, we, <clears throat> we can tell the difference between the sound of a clarinet and the sound of an oboe, and now try to describe it. And then he would say, you know, is there such a thing as an expert judgment on the genuineness of expressions of feelings? So, you know, w some of us are better at this than others, distinguishing a genuine loving look from a pr pretended loving look, distinguishing a sincere expression of love from an insincere expression. And all these subtle uh, distinctions that we, we make, and that... that some of us are more subtle than others, and we're, we're increasingly subtle with regard to people we know best, you know. But uh, distinctions of tones of voice, facial expressions, all of those things go into our understanding of ourselves and, and one another. And it seems to me, and it seemed to Wittgenstein, that we have a much more fine-grained appreciation of those things than... Uh, than we can put into words. But that, um, Joanna, that's making those sorts of distinctions which can't be put into words is just what creatures like us do. That's part of what yeah. this would be, the sorts of creatures we are. But if that's right, then um, this idea that there are limits to language looks much less momentous than the um, blurb for this debate su suggested. Yeah. Sorry, can I just come in? Yes. I, I mean, because I mean, one response to, to, to the blurb is, well, of course there are limits of language. Yeah. Of course there are things that we can't put into words. It's notorious that we can't describe the smell of coffee even. You know, sort of every, you know, homely examples like that. Mm. Joanna, did you want to come in on that? Well, I think it's partly, isn't it, about fixity. I think if you're trying to fix meanings of words, if you're absolutely determined that a word must have a single meaning through time, um, so in a sense, you're trying to limit language again. I mean, this sort of idea that you're trying to say that the word must always mean these particular sets of notions. Then in a sense, that's completely untenable because words change. They're metaphorical in origin. I mean, Owen Barfield with his great theory that the, were all words in their origins are fundamentally poetic and metaphorical, and therefore they're ossified through time. So we become less receptive to them. I mean, you can think of with bated breath, Shakespearean metaphors, where we then get used to them, eaten out of house and home, and they become just commonplace, almost cliches. And so I think this sense within language, I think if you endlessly try to imagine that, as we've heard, you know, a word is a thing, it has a single correlative, then in a way that should be blown apart, that should be indicated. Similarly with, say, with certain sort of scientific disciplines, again, talking about what Paul's saying about the bell, you know, not being the sound of the bell, not being the bell. If you say the brain is, is a computer, you know, you're obviously creating a metaphor, but then the point at which you mistake that for the thing you're actually predetermining thought again. So I think it's actually it's useful. I wouldn't lose faith in the debate. I think it's very useful to have a sense of these, the limits that both we impose on what we express and how we express it, but also with words, that sort of unreliability of words actually mm. as well. But Paul, there's a difference between questions of meaning and then questions about the content of what you called earlier, or maybe it was very called earlier, cognitive experiences. Experiences. Yeah, I, actually, I, w I wanted to respond to what Ray was saying about the the smell of coffee and, mm. and the ability to put that into words or to put the difference between the oboe and the clarinet into words. It's a very, it's a very interesting question. There is something very tempting about that. But the, 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 the thing that pulls me back from it is the following uh, observation. Um, with any concept, if, if, if you're to understand somebody's description, 
of an experience or anything else using those concepts, you have to have competence with those concepts. You have to have those concepts in mind or at hand. And um, so if you take the, to take the example of the, of, of the color red, you know, that's never an example that's brought up. People don't say, oh, you, you, know, you can't describe the color of things, but you, can't, you, you can describe the color of things, but you can't describe the smell of coffee. But the color of things, you see, it, it, the, the competence conditions on the color concepts uh, involve that you've had experience of those very colors. So there's a famous thought experiment in philosophy. Mary. Uh, Mary, the, the neuroscientist who grows up in a black and white room and learns everything that there is to know about quantum physics, about neuroscience. You can learn all of that. And then the question is, will she know what it's like to see red if she's not experienced red, even though you know all the underlying physics? And the very strong intuitive answer is, she won't know what it's like to see red until she's actually emerged from the black and white room and seen the color red for the first time. So the competence condition on having red is that you've had that experience. But similarly, in the case of the smell of coffee, it could be one of those experiential primitives whose competence condition is that you've had to have had that smell, just like color. And so once you have had it, once you have the concept, I can describe the smell to you, but unless you have it, I won't be able to. And that, that's all that's going on. So it's interesting to think, is there really a difference between coffee and, and red? Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, difference between red... I mean, I'm, I'm happy in a sense with, with the idea that, you know, similar questions arise from, uh, with regard to colours as with regard to smells. I mean, look at how many different blues there are on this table. And, um, you know, do we have a word for every kind of blue we have on, on this table? Well, some, some people are, you know, some people have a better training, some people had a different kind of education, come from a different kind of culture. It was said, you know, uh, not so long ago, we had all that hoo-ha about the dress. Is it, is it gold and white or is it blue and, and black? <laughs> And uh, it was said in, in discussions of that uh, that the ancients, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Egyptians, uh, uh, couldn't see blue. And I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's an interesting, uh, it's, it, it's an interesting thing to, to think about. You know, uh, you think, well, how could they not see blue? Look, there it is. You know, <laughs> that's the blue. Uh, and, uh, but but it, it, it does seem to me imaginable that people would not make that distinction. Now, I mean, with regard to the concept red, of course, we don't have a single concept red. We have, also, you know, we have scarlet, we have all sorts of different kinds of reds, and, and some people are more subtle, like with, the, like with the facial expressions and the tones of voice that I said earlier on. Some people, when they're describing colour, are more articulate, they make finer grain distinctions than other people. And it will... It, let me just finish yeah. with this thought, that, 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 that ties in with some of the things that Joanna's saying, that... that um, I'm very interested in this idea of poetry as, as what T.S. Eliot called a raid on the inarticulate. You know, uh, I mean, the, of course there are things that we, we, we're not going to succeed in, in putting into words, but the, uh, the creativity of language shown by a poet uh, often takes the form of, as Eliot said, a raid on the inarticulate. We're trying to extend the boundaries of language. We're trying to say things either that haven't said be been, been said before or saying th uh, things in a new way that hasn't been done before. I mean, that's, thank you, Ray. That's precisely the point I wanted to pick up and, and put to you, Joanna. So um, Ray used the example of the various shades of subtle distinctions between the shades of blue on this table. We or might say that a poet or a literary artist of one sort or another is someone who dwells in those subtle, subtle distinctions and, 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 as Ray put it, mentioning Eliot, ra makes um, raids on the inexpressible. Yes. Well, I, I mean, I think it's whether you... So whether you, if you want to make forays into the truly inexpressible in language, then, you know, create a mandala, as Jung does obsessively. In fact, you know, create a purely visual symbol of the cosmos and the self. Or, you know, create a piece of visual art. Or I mean, I think what, what you're doing within poetic language all the time is you're drawing on the extensive resonance and, again, the, the echoes, the associations of words, the fact that words are historical documents, they move people emotionally, but also they register former civilizations. You know, they register the fact we have these words, these old Sanskrit words, you know, these pre prefaces like vid, video. You know, that they show that historical peoples, the, the you know tribes moved and merged and you know met the Greeks, and further words emerged into further layers of consciousness. So you're dealing. I think that's the part that interests me. That these are not these words are not entirely logical or rational. They invoke further states of consciousness that we've lost. Um, they invoke former realms. So even if you know, you're talking about 
mechanical metaphors, machines, you know, they invoke further notions of, you know, deus ex machina, these further uses of these words, that no word is completely consistent, words aren't facts. And I think that's, it's that range of language that's so intriguing, I think. Theme two. Um, Paul, you said in your opening remarks, well, you raised, you raised a question, are there forms of experience that can't be captured in thought? What, do you, what is your view on that question? I mean, that, that's, the, that's the question we're circling around constantly. We are, we well. are. And, uh, and I think uh, music is a very good example. I think maybe I mentioned it previously, maybe Ray did as well. Um, you know, we do have... The, we, when, when we listen to a great piece of music, um, we very much have the impression that we are picking up on some kind of meaning that's over and above the sounds and the tones themselves. I mean, the formalist view... Edward Hanslick tried to defend in the 19th century that said, uh, look, music just consists in tones, as it were, moving in time, not even realizing that um, uh, there, is, there is a metaphorical aspect to that description it's, itself. Um, that, even that seems too impoverished. Uh, on the other hand, when you try to say what the meaning of a particular piece of music is, so for instance, the, the wonderful opening of the Beethoven Fourth Piano Concerto, which Roger Scruton, I think, is, you know... It, it, interestingly described as an expression of tranquil gratitude, those sort of G major chords. Um, when you see one, any, any one such description, you're immediately struck that there are alternative descriptions that you could give, that that one doesn't have to be the only one with which to describe the content of this music. So you realize that there is some kind, there's somehow, either it's a case of indeterminacy between, as it were, the conceptual resources that you have, or there is something else being expressed here that you only inadequately get at by using the standard propositional resources that you have. And I think that's a very, very significant effect. Uh, the thing not to, not to confuse that with, it seems to me, is that people then say, uh, one of the ways in which they, they think propositional thought is inadequate is they say, well, look, if, if you could capture it in propositional terms, then I could simply tell you what the meaning of the Beethoven Fourth Piano Concerto is, and you wouldn't have to listen to it. Um, now, that would be, it would be a terrible problem for any theory that had that consequence, because, of course, uh, the music is essential. So one of the things that's going on here is that it's not just the meaning, which is hard to articulate, but the fact that that meaning is embodied in a certain kind of vehicle for its expression, that's completely essential to the experience and can't be substituted for. I mean, Ray, isn't part of the problem, it's not clear that asking about the meaning of a piece of music is the right, right question to be asking. Now, as, we, as, as you alluded earlier to, Ray, there's a long tradition going back at least as far as Schopenhauer of f philosophers giving extraordinary significance and status to absolute m music without words as somehow putting us in touch with aspects of reality that language doesn't. Where does Wittgenstein fit into that story? Because I mean, he had some very interesting things to say about yeah, music. Yeah, I, I mean, Wittgenstein, of course, was very influenced by Schopenhauer. Yeah. Um, and there are Schopenhauerian themes and echoes of Schopenhauerian views throughout the Tractatus. Um, he doesn't, of course, just repeat Schopenhauer's metaphysics, I, I, which Schopenhauer brought to bear on the understanding of music. So, so, so for Schopenhauer, music is the expression of the will. So in, if you have the world as will and representation, uh, our language is describing the world as representation. Music is the single thing, according to Schopenhauer, that gives us access to the world as will, i.e. the essence, the, the, the thing in itself. Now, Wittgenstein doesn't uh, buy into that, but, uh, and I think for, for Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, music is a big problem, because on one hand, music was the art form that meant the most to Wittgenstein. I mean, uh, if you go through Wittgenstein's manuscripts, he's, he's writing music all the time. Music is just going on in his head. He's, and, and, he, and he knows he could, he could whistle whole symphonies off by heart. He's, you know, he's, he, his life was just suffused with music. And music meant an enormous amount to him. And yet, on the theory of meaning in the Tractatus, music doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so we have a, a very grave problem there. And the, what I meant, mentioned in, 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 in my beginning about the distinction between saying and showing, well, you may say that that helps a bit because now music can not say something, but nevertheless, as it were, convey something, show something. And, and what does it show? Well, it shows the inexpressible. I, I, I realise I'm going on a bit, but no, let, let, me, let me just finish this thought with regards to the later philosophy. Now, the later philosophy has an interesting turn on this. In the philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein says, 
Understanding a sentence is more akin to understanding a musical theme than you might think. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, the old problematic was this. We, it, you know, Wittgenstein, the way Wittgenstein sets it up is we know what it is for a proposition to mean something. The words of the proposition uh, stand for the objects in the fact and the proposition states the fact. And now we have a problem about what, uh, what music might mean. The later philosophy turns that on its head and says, well, we know what music means. And it's obvious that that meaning isn't to do with correlations of objects. And then now he says, and now look at the understanding of a sentence like that. And, and it seems to me that poetry is, is a golden example of that. You, you pick a great line of poetry and you say, what does that mean? There's such a thing as understanding that, that, that line of poetry, understanding that poem. What does it mean? There are some, and, and Wittgenstein says in investigations, sometimes you show your understanding not by, as it were, putting what you understand into different words, but, but by showing precisely that it can't be put into different words. Mm. I do um, love Wittgenstein, yeah. but when he uses words like correlation of objects, I do want to smash him in the head with a pair of symbols. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, and I think, I think, isn't there in this a slight, there's a discrepancy that we're, we're trying to explore, which is about the meaning of something in a kind of objective sense, if that were possible, and then a subjective response to something. So, for example, on me your voice falls as they say love should, like an enormous yes. So that's Larkin trying to express the effect of music lines on Sidney Bechet on, on him. And I think that's, a, again, it's a beautiful, an enormous yes. He's just saying, again, the, the pretty much inexpressible in language. He's saying this is a, a vast, emphatic assertion of yes to the world. And he's talking about the direct impact of this, this non-linguistic form mm. on him and trying to relay it. Language but it's is, a totally yeah. subjective response. It only means in terms of Larkin's own personal experience, but then we read it and we're moved. Again. But it's a subjective response in language which is, by definition, public, Paul. By definition, public. Um, <laughs> it's certainly using a public language, but you, know, uh, uh, you may be expressing something that is subjective and interior and that mm. it would be very hard to get at. Uh, this is where, you know, where I, 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 I don't know, I, I guess, Ray... Wittgenstein is famous for something known as the private language argument, which says that in a, in a public language, you can't express something that is irreducibly interior and subjective. Mm. I mean, you know, we'd have to get subtle about it if we really wanted to. But uh, I don't think there is a good argument for that anywhere in the investigations or in the subsequent literature. I think that uh, there is an important sense in which many of our states are subjective, um, that doesn't mean that it is impossible to convey them to other people, but it, it, does, it does mean that that might be hard and that, in fact, it might not be completely, perfectly communicable. And I also think that it, doesn't, uh, it isn't true that if you can't convey something to somebody else, that therefore it is, as, as it were, a semantically inert device because you can report it to yourself, write it down in a diary, remember it later, and that can be of great significance. Theme three. Liter so the kind of literary expression that Joanna is re referring to, but, it's, um, it's pu but that, that's publicly accessible because it, I mean, Larkin's, Larkin's attempt to describe or capture that experience um, has, has, is, is meaningful to us in some ways. Yes, he hasn't relayed his inner shorthand. No, well, as well, we, we don't relay our... So that's the stream of consciousness yeah. problem when the modernists are trying to invoke consciousness in the novel. They don't yeah. invoke that pre-linguistic as we wake and we see... We, we make words to ourselves that are not entirely formatted, don't we? If you catch yourself thinking, it's a not entirely beautiful sentence. Mm. So everything, it submits necessarily to a form of further layer of rendering itself cogent. But I think the initial invocation is highly subjective. By the way, I mean, sub subjectivity uh, has a kind of orthogonal bearing on this because, you, as I say, you can have... There, there's a question of... If you have a, a definite subjective meaning that you have experienced, that you have, find it hard to communicate to other people... There's a question of whether you can capture that in the words of a public language and thereby convey it. But then there's a further question of exactly what its character is and whether you can explain it to yourself in purely conceptual terms. Those are two different things. So the really complicated landscape here is that there is 
the public language resources and my ability to communicate with others, there is a realm of subjective meaning and a question about whether the realm of subjective meaning can be exhausted in propositional terms or whether there's something that always escapes that net. And I, I'm inclined to think there, there is. Uh... Ray, as you said in your opening remarks, one of the things that escapes th that net for Wittgenstein is ethics. Why? Can you, in, can, in the early work. In the early work. Yeah, can you... Yeah. Explain why he thought that. Was, well, he, I, I, he described ethics in one, in, I think, in one very short, characteristically short, terse paper as running up against the limits of language. Oh, okay, the, in, yeah. in his lecture on ethics, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is an admittedly strange lecture, because he, he's not talking about ethics, he's talking about a particular experience. Um, it's interesting for me, because I've had a similar kind of experience. Wittgenstein was describing an overwhelming experience of feeling, as he puts it, absolutely safe. Uh, you know, he, he says, it, you know, he, he, I don't know where he was, he was walking, and he suddenly felt absolutely safe. And his point in that lecture is that this was a very powerful experience for him, but that if he tried to convey it in words, he would, he would dismiss every, every construction that he could come up with as inadequate for conveying that experience. He would say, no, it, that's not quite right, that's not quite right. And, and so he describes that as running up against the limits of language. And he, and, and he does that in a lecture on ethics because the more or less unspoken conclusion here is that we have the same thing when we try to say anything ethical, that we're running up against the limits of language. Now, in the Tractatus, the, there's a theory of meaning in place, as it were, to, 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 to explain that, which is that... that propositions get their meaning from picturing facts and he takes it for granted I think that there are no ethical facts and therefore uh, there are no ethical propositions either. Um, you were quite um, dismissive earlier on about this was idea. I, oh no, this, no, I was this, only dismissive this of this one that, phrase of the well, otherwise lovely this Wittgenstein. This idea that the early yes. Wittgenstein um, saw language as picturing facts or picturing the world. Um, certainly for you, poetic language, literary language, it's, that's, it's not in that business. Yeah, I think there's often, I mean, it's a, it's a in, I mean, it's an intrinsic possibility within language that we mistake words for facts, of course, because we use them always to denote something. We're trying always to capture something. But of course, you know, they're not numbers. So we don't have a fixed, if we talk about something in, in verbal terms, we were discussing time earlier. You know, time is, when you talk about the present, you're not talking about the number three that we all agree on. It has a value we all agree on. Just, you know, if you, you've put, the, here are three cups, we can instantly dismiss that. Whereas if you talk about the present, again, it has all these associations, layers of possible meaning. Different disciplines will interpret it in different ways. And so I think it's that, again, it's the, the extent of available possibility. But I think that's a good thing. I'm not in any way. And I think, again, I've been arguing against attempts to shut that down. And earlier about the sort of, um, this thing about limits by euphemism or limits by control. I think, again, that's an attempt to shut this down where you, you have something like the Nazis, um, where they're trying to... There's a great book by Victor Klemper about this, mm. um, all about the Nazification of language in Germany. And he's effectively saying, as well as using euphemisms, of course, the Germans did, they used the sort of you know, intensified interrogation kind of euphemisms that actually we know now today. Um, the extreme rendition, but they they also attempted to insert Nazified sentiment into existing words. So I use you know the example is the das ewige Deutschland. You know you suddenly have a, a German term ewig, which has always been you know pretty much has been understood to mean eternal, mm. and then you suddenly say the eternal Deutschland, and people using ewig have a Nazi aspect to their consciousness without realizing. So again, that sort of availability of these changes and nuances with la in language to then actually set limits on people, to control people. I think this is incredibly tangible. So saying the word is not the thing, yes, I think we on this panel would agree with that. But then the fact, again, that the word has this almost magical power of invocation to change atmosphere. I think that's... And that's what all the ancient esoteric texts are about. You know, the words of power, the ancient Egyptian soul arriving into the afterworld and naming the gods and controlling them. And in the beginning was the word. I mean, that's all about this strange, fluent aspect of language to, to actually influence what occurs. Can I just say Can something I, about in the beginning was the yeah. word? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because uh, Wittgenstein once thought of adopting as the motto for philosophical investigations, Goethe's change on that, uh, in deed. Anfang war die Tat, mm. uh, in the beginning was the deed, um, to, to, to indicate, as it were, 
his, his change of perspective. Mm. Paul, you wanted to come in on this? I wanted to engage Joanna just a little bit about it because there is this... Um, I mean, you're pointing to what I would call um, abuses of language or, you know, invocations of certain kinds of words and certain kinds of rhetorical device to achieve certain kinds of ends. But, you know, one of the things you were doing just now is pointing that out in language, uh, correcting the, the, excess, the rhetorical excess of a particular linguistic device, linguistically. So, you know, uh, th by itself, I think the fact that people use rhetoric and they use it to inflame and to... Uh, insight and so forth and so on isn't by itself a reflection about language itself or thought itself because in fact thought and language can correct those excesses. Uh, it's rather about the fact that you can use anything to do good things or bad things and, uh, and so it's really a matter of the use to which you put it. Yes, don't worry. Um, as a novelist, I'm, yeah, I, I struggle all the time, of course, as, as we all do with the the registers of language and the uses to which one would put it. And I think we all understand the paradox intrinsic to the debate. I know, but there is a tendency to sort of say, you know, language. language is this dangerous thing because, look, it's been used dangerously. No, no, I'm not, say, I'm not saying language intrinsically. Yeah, right. I'm saying yeah. we, mu we all, I think, and I'm sure, I suspect we all agree, right. that these words are not... You cannot entirely fix the meaning of a word and then say it's a kind of, you know, it's a, a dead, neutral word that, you know, it, every single word has this this germinating power within it, it can be then changed well, or further I mean, that, that, can, that is a point that can be taken to excess too. Um, I mean, they're, they're <laughs> Not by a novelist. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible. Yeah. That's why you're a novelist and he's a philosopher. That's yeah. <laughs> Did you want to develop that thought? Well, yes. Or? I mean, look, this is very important and very interesting. Languages develop. And so a, a word has a history. Uh, it's, our, it's harder to think of a concept as having a history, but for reasons we won't go into. But a word, a word has a history in the sense that it can be used to express different things at different times. Now, one of the really interesting questions about, about linguistic meaning is whether at any given time it has what you might call a well-demarcated meaning, which is such that somebody has got to grasp that meaning in order to know what you mean, and then everything else is sort of an extra that you may or may not know. So, for instance, you know, you know, the word Rome, that refers to a certain city. Okay. Uh, there are people who know a lot more about Rome, including its history and so forth and so on, but we think that's not required in order for you to understand that I said, I'm going to Rome next week. You, know, you don't need to be an ancient historian to know all of that. So there, there seems to be a, a demarcation of the things you've got to know in order to use Rome as a, ref, as a name for Rome, and then everything else is kind of ancillary to it. That boundary can change over time, but it does look like, you know, to the extent to which we think there is such a thing as competence with a word, that's a, it's a delim delimited. Yes, but if I told you to think of Rome without imbuing it with your doubtless huge knowledge of Rome, it would be very hard for you to create that barrier in your own mind, I suspect. Ray, where do you um, find yourself? There's a sort of deflationary uh, impulse to mm. Paul's remarks. Really? No. <laughs> no. Deflationary <laughs> in what way? Um, that some of this talk about the limits of language is really is, is less significant than we, that we might think. I mean, that, that's my sense of what the drift of what you've been saying, is to say that some of it is obviously true, but trivi trivially mm. true. Right. Yeah, right, trivially true. I, 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 I'm not convinced that's what Paul was saying. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but um, sh to be sure, there are limits of language. Uh, uh, now, I, I mean, what Joanna was saying about there's, there's, you know, there's something totalitarian about imposing limits, of course. It's not a question of imposing limits, it's a question of recognising limits. Or if you're, you know, uh, 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 you're, you're a determined and creative poet, as it were, not recognising limits and trying, mm. to do, you know, trying to do something about it. So, um, but but I, I think possibly, I'm not entirely sure, but I think possibly where Paul and I differ is with regard to uh, whether it's an interesting fact or whether it's a fact at all that you can't describe the, ta the, the smell of coffee. Mm. It seems to me that you can't, and, and, and that's an interesting Sorry, fact. Sorry, Paul, I didn't mean to attribute views to you you don't hold, um, which is a sort of professional hazard um, doing this sort of thing. But um, do you want to respond to Ray there? Because it, you, it did seem as though you didn't think it was a particularly interesting um, fact about us and our linguistic behaviour that we can't describe in language the smell of coffee. Um, well, as I was saying, the, the, the thing about this that puzzles me is that I'm aware that for a, wor a very wide range of concepts, including those of the colours, so people don't, as I say, he, he goes back to the example of the smell of coffee, but not the colour of, um, 
as it might be uh, Granny Smith apple. Uh, somehow people don't think, oh, you can't describe the color of, of this. Paul, I'm, I'm happy dealing with colors. You know, if you chose two uh, of these of these panels here and said, okay, they're, they're different blues, now describe the difference. That that would do for me as in place of the smell of coffee. Well, well, but, but first of all, that's that's a slum, somewhat different example because we're not talking about dif differing shades of, of smells of coffee. Uh, that can happen too. But that's precisely what we're talking about. Oh well, we're, we're, we're no, talking, talking about the smell of this coffee rather than that coffee. Oh, well, that that. Otherwise, that's, simply, otherwise, the phrase "the smell of coffee" would do it. Don't well, it would, and and, <laughs> and, and, and there would be, a, and it would there would be an equal difficulty just about that. That is, to the extent to which you think there is some generic thing that's called the smell of coffee. Let's suppose there is. Unless you've had the smell of coffee, you're not going to get that. So the same thing goes for red. You don't need red. You don't need to introduce all of the different shades. In fact, it is a point uh, that one can make that there are millions and millions of shades of every one of the colors that you are able to recognize. And you recognize them as such. That is, you discriminate them in your visual experience as different shades of red. Now, you don't have a word for every one of them. And in fact... You couldn't introduce one. They're just, you know, your, 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 your brain is too, is too small to do all of that, and you don't want to waste the computational resources. But you don't recognize them as the individual shades. You recognize them as shades of red. You because you have the conceptual competence. You've got the, generic, the, you've got the yeah. generic concept, and so you recognize them as shades but of you red. Could, you don't need to make those discriminations. But I suppose you could start saying vermilion, puce, magenta, and yes. they're all completely different experiences. And you would have red. to have experience of yes. those shades. Yes, and as you say, there'll be an er uh, red or an ineffable red that right. none of us can even see or apprehend. You know, Without great having ancient had red. Just yes. It, but so also, I mean, from. this is very depressing for, you know, wine aficionados who spend years and years of their lives, you know, invoking beautiful <laughs> adjectival phrases I can see to Professor Smith wine. leaning over here. <laughs> yes, have something precisely. to say about this later. And also, you know, all those squillions of rather mediocre poets who toasted the arrival of coffee houses in London with these vaulting phrases enunciating the delirium attached to the very smell of coffee. So, I mean, I think, you know, there have been very significant efforts even to attempt these apparently impossible <laughs> remits. But, but we think they're intrinsically ridiculous, don't they? I mean, well, I, we don't, I know. I mean, those poets, it was all right. They loved Not coffee. Poets, it was very but exciting. We, no, but when we hear... I mean, there are now such things as coffee festivals as well as literary and philosophy festivals. Um, and people will speak in... Um, exaggeratedly refined terms about different smells of coffee. Well, I, I think given the creativity of, of some users of language, it behoves us to keep an open mind on this. You know, so, you know, it may well be that you know, somebody will succeed in a poem or a novel or in something in capturing you know, what we're now saying language can't capture. And then, you know, as it were, you've, you've, you've made a successful raid on the inarticulate. And is that what distinguishes what we call literary language from... I, I don't think I don't, there's a hard and fast distinction here. Mm. I, I mean, to, to some extent, we're all poets. You know, I mean, you know insofar as we, we, we try to rise above cliche-ridden language, we're always trying to you know, uh, uh, describe something vividly or not, you know, in a novel kind of way or, or whatever. I'm afraid we're out of time. I'm sure you want to join me in thanking the members of the panel for doing the most extraordinary job of trying to express the inexpressible. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this Institute of Art and Ideas podcast. If you enjoyed this debate and want to carry on the discussion, visit iai.tv. Remember to subscribe and review on iTunes.